Having overthrown Roger Mortimer and established himself as the ruler of England, Edward III was keen to demonstrate his military credentials and did so in spectacular fashion at the Battle of Halladon Hill in 1333. Here he decimated a larger Scottish army, experimenting with tactics he would later use at Cressé. The First War of Scottish Independence was still raging when Edward II of England was deposed in 1327 by Roger Mortimer, Earl of March. The war had been going wrong for the English since the death of the warrior king Edward I in 1307, but following the catastrophic defeat at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, a state of almost perpetual war had existed in Northumberland. Despite being militarily ineffective, Edward II refused to negotiate a truce, but once overthrown, Mortimer sought peace and compelled the new English king, Edward III, to sign the Treaty of Edinburgh in 1328, ending the First War of Scottish Independence. Peace did not last long though. In 1330, Edward III engineered the downfall of Mortimer and took substantive control of the government. His attention turned towards Scotland and his grandfather's plan to make it a vassal kingdom. The death of Robert I, the history knows as Robert the Bruce, in 1329 afforded him the opportunity to resume the war. Robert had died leaving his seven-year-old son David as his heir and Edward saw an opportunity to overthrow this child monarch. In 1332 he covertly supported the claim of Edward Balliol, son of the former King John of Scotland, over and above David. Balliol was crowned but he was deposed a few months later and fled to Carlisle. He requested support from Edward III and pledged to cede Berwick-upon-Tweed to the English king. Edward took up the challenge and moved his army north. Edward's forces arrived at Berwick in spring 1333 and he imposed a close siege around the town including a sea blockade. An agreement was struck with the town that they would surrender if not relieved by the 11th of July 1333 and they provided hostages to this effect. The Scottish meanwhile, under the command of Sir Archibald Douglas, had recruited a significant army. He invaded Northern England and advanced towards Bamburgh Castle, where Queen Philippa, Edward's wife, was now resident. Doubtless entirely contempt for the strength of Bamburgh's defences, Edward remained firmly in situ at Berwick. En route, however, the Scottish army had managed to insert a small party of soldiers into the town via a partially destroyed bridge over the Tweed. This prompted Sir Alexander Seton to withdraw his offer of surrender prompting fury from Edward III. The hostages, including Seton's own son, were hung at the rate of two a day until the town would surrender. To stop the bloodshed, Seton made a new agreement with Edward, that they would surrender if by the 19th of July 1333, the Scottish had not won a pitched battle or effected a crossing of an agreed stretch of the River Tweed or insert a force of at least 200 soldiers into the town. The Scottish army was around 14,000 strong versus around 10,000 English, however the latter were well equipped. The English aimed to prevent the Scottish inserting a relief force into Berwick-upon-Tweed. The left was commanded by Edward Balliol, their centre by King Edward III and their right by Thomas Earl of Norfolk. The Scottish aimed to insert a force of at least 200 men at arms into Berwick-upon-Tweed to prevent its surrender to the English. The Scottish left was commanded by Sir Archibald Douglas and the Scottish right by John Randolph, Earl of Moray. Douglas delayed taking any action until the 19th of July 1333 the very last day before the agreement between the English and Seton expired. The Scottish force initially drew up on higher ground, the Witches No, immediately to the north of Halladon Hill. This was a strong position, but the onus was on the Scots to attack. Edward would win by just sitting and remaining stationary. To fight the English, Douglas would need to lead his forces downhill cross through boggy ground and then ascend Halladon Hill to attack the English position. It was an unenviable task but he had more troops and in the immediate term only needed 200 soldiers to break through the English lines and reach Berwick. Douglas configured his forces into three densely packed formations of spearmen, a repeat of the Shilatrons used so effectively at Bannockburn. 
All personnel were dismounted, with the horses retained at Witch's No. In response, the English, having left a sufficient force to sustain the close siege of Berwick, moved to occupy Halladon Hill, which was the highest ground immediately to the north of the town. By controlling this position, they commanded all the road access to Berwick, and any advancing force would have to fight them to gain entry. Accordingly, Edward drew up his army in a defensive formation. Three divisions of infantry were each flanked by archers, who were arranged in a projecting wedge, allowing a withering crossfire to be delivered against advancing forces. All personnel were dismounted, and the horses kept to the rear. The battle seems to have commenced around midday with a challenge of single combat. A giant Scotsman named Turnbull fought but lost to a Norfolk knight, Robert Benhale. Following this, the Scottish forces then began their attack, with all three Shilatrons descending from Witch's No and entering the bog that separated them from the English position. The muddy ground slowed the advance of the Scots and made them an easy target for the English archers who started their deadly barrage. As the arrows hit home at speeds of around 90 miles an hour, casualties amongst the Scottish ranks mounted. Despite the hailstorm of arrows, the Scottish forces pressed on. It was the Scottish right, under the Earl of Moray, who were the first to connect with the English ranks, having seen Edward Balliol's banner on the left of the English line as they pushed hard to it. But they suffered heavy losses from the archers' assault, with contemporary writers describing that many turned their faces away from the hailstorm of arrows. Whatever force finally made it to Balliol's men-at-arms was quickly broken. The central divisions of the Scottish army fared little better. Running the gauntlet of the archers, they sustained huge casualties before meeting the forces directly under Edward's command. The Scottish left, under Sir Archibald Douglas himself, seems to have included additional men, either incorporated into the main division or as a fourth group. It is most likely these were the contingency. If the Scots fail to overwhelm the English, these are the men that would break through and arrive at Berwick to augment the garrison and satisfy the agreement between Edward and the town. Fierce fighting ensued. As casualties mounted, the remaining Scottish troops broke into rout. The Scottish fled downhill, with the nobility hoping to get back to the Witch's No to mount their horses and escape. However, the dismounted English knights now left their infantry positions, mounted their own steeds and charged the fleeing Scots. It was a total rout, with vast numbers of Scottish troops, nobility and commoner alike, killed. Those Scottish knights who made it back to Witch's No found their aides had fled with their horses, leaving them to their fate. Casualties had been widely exaggerated by the chroniclers, but likely accounted for the greater part of the original Scottish force. Halladon Hill was a decisive English victory that left Berwick in English hands and Scotland defenceless. But Edward's ambitions were in France and he did not consolidate his victory with a full-scale attempt to subdue the Scots. Balliol's government was never accepted and in the longer term Halladon Hill simply marked a successful start to an ultimately unsuccessful strategy. However, in a wider context, it was also the first battle fought by Edward III and proved the effectiveness of the English longbow and dismounted men-at-arms, a configuration he would use to great effect at the Battles of Crecy in 1346 and which later would be repeated at the Battles of Poitiers in 1356 and Agincourt in 1415. Oh,